together from what I could remember of it. Unfortunately, because the textbook shuffles things all over the place, uh, I tried to unshuffle it to get it into an order that makes sense. Uh, so some of these chapter references aren't perfect, but they're not horrible. Chapter 8 is all about moles. So just dealing with how you apply moles to atoms, formulas, that kind of stuff. Chapter 9 is now equations. So how do we apply the mole concept to equations? Okay. Chapter 8 really brought in Avogadro's number. Chapter 9 ignores Avogadro's number pretty much entirely and just focuses on what you would do with moles. Then we move into molarity, which I think is chapter 13. Not positive on that, but I think that's where it shows up. Okay. Uh, and really what we're talking about is solutions. And molarity becomes tricky because it adds yet another conversion factor that you now have to manipulate. I just like the mole concept. Gases, we just pretty much will wrap up here, which is chapter 10, I think. And then we get random bits, I think, from chapter 3. And then everything that we've already covered this semester is fair game. Because I've been seeing some issues with balancing equations and even identifying what that chemical reaction is, I will probably throw questions like that on the test. Right? Uh, the other reason why I want to do that is if we look at everything above that in our topics, almost all of those are calculations. And so to have 40 questions on your exam of all calculations would take too much time and be really frustrating to deal with as far as I'm concerned as a student. So I'd like to have some kind of general topic questions. So that's where I'll probably pull from the other stuff so that you don't have to spend as much time running calculations. So you're saying, well, why don't you just shorten the test? Sure, if I had a one question test, it's really short, really easy. If you get that one question wrong, what happens? Yeah. You fail. So, of course, it wouldn't be one question, Mike. It, well, <laughs> no, scale it to 20 questions. So where do you, where do you put that? Yeah. Where, where do you put that line? Is so that that's why I try and keep it at 40. And the other reason why I match 40 is that that matches the length for your final two. So the rough amount of time you should be spending per question on the semester exams is about the same amount of time you should be spending on the final. So I'm trying to get you prepared for the final, okay? Which brings up another point. This is going to be a difficult exam, right? There isn't really any way around that because it's taking the concepts that we learned in the previous units and makes you go through and apply them, okay? So if you have any weaknesses earlier on, those weaknesses are gonna show in this exam, right? That said, I do try to write the questions about moles, specifically on moles so you didn't you weren't getting tested on two different topics, okay? But you will see an increase in the amount of questions that tests on two different directions, okay? If you have to move into more chemistry classes, virtually every question you see on an exam tests on multiple topics. 130, we try to keep it relatively simple and only test on single topics, okay? Um, oh, the final, which brings up a point about the final. After this exam, we have covered roughly everything for the final. Right. And I said, well, don't we still have time after this to prepare for the final? Yes, and we do have some random topics that we have to get through right, to cover that. I see you. Um, but most of the content is ready to go for the final which means you should be spending your time practicing for this exam, and a lot of that is transferring over to the final. Okay. So after this exam, you should immediately start preparing, looking at the practice final, and mark, at least marking out questions. I should know the answer to this. Not do you know the answer, I should know the answer. Okay. And go through and mark everything within the test after exam three with those kind of things. Then go back through and see if you do know those concepts. Any place that you're weak, you can go through and study that um, before worrying about the new content that we'll be moving forward with next Thursday. Not next, this Thursday, the following Thursday. Right. Because we have a relatively few amount of slides left within the lecture show, I also have the practice exam pulled up and we can work on that maybe today, depending on how time goes, uh, but almost undoubtedly Thursday we'll have spent looking just at review content preparing for this exam, okay? So Thursday, you should come in ready to go, like, I don't understand this, help me do it, okay? And we can address those specific concerns, okay? 
With the final as well, it is cumulative and it is a resurrection final. Meaning if you do better on the final, let's say you've scored 50% on all of the exams, but in the final you score 100%. Okay. Awesome. These ones in the wheel. <laughs> Great job. Uh, what that means is that one of those semester exams now becomes 100%. So the final for you is now not worth 150, but 200 points, because you got an extra 50 points added back to one of your exam scores. So the final can really help out your overall grade if you can prove that you've learned the material. Okay? So this exam may be really difficult, but hopefully you do well on it, because it'll set you up for the final, and then it'll double down, and you can replace one of the older exams. Sure. Uh, the final is whatever's in the syllabus. May 10th sounds right. Is that Thursday? Then May 10th does not sound right, and I would have said May 12th. Which would be 10th? 10th is Saturday. <laughs> so maybe I'm looking at the wrong year in my calendar, which becomes a bit problematic. No, you're right. I remember what I'm looking at now. Yeah, May 11th is graduation, which is Friday, which then means May 10th would be Thursday, yes. So it would be May 10th in this room at... Seven. Yeah, because we start at 8.30, and yeah, that's probably what's going to happen is we're going to be the 7 a.m. test. So awesomeness. Yeah. Uh, sorry, there's nothing I can do about it. That's the way the schedule works. That's not me. Okay, so it'll be 7 to 8.50, so 110 minutes to go through and take the test. Does that work? London, it looked like you maybe you had a question or a statement. No, you're good? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So that's a good point. Let's address that because we are recording for this. Uh, exam three, you remember you get a little cheat sheet, three and a half, what, three by five, note card. Okay. I will try to remember to post an announcement about that, but I keep forgetting. If someone wants to send me an email to say, hey, post a freaking announcement, that would be nice so that I can make sure everybody gets the memo because there's several people that have decided to stop showing up to class and they may still be taking the test, I don't know. Okay. So it might be nice to let them know too. Okay. Um, I will collect the three and a half or the three by five note card. That'll get stapled to the front of the exam. Is that extra credit? Okay. It is not extra credit. <laughs> <laughs> what that note card is is your opportunity to do better on exam three. Okay. Do not rely on the note card providing answers. Okay. That is a really bad idea. You should be practicing with the note card to find out what content you have to keep looking up and put that content on the note card. Don't just be like, night before the exam, let's throw some stuff on it. You should be working on building that note card now okay, by going through the practice exam. Okay? Kind of make sense? Is there extra credit? Uh, all exams have some form of extra credit, okay? at least in two places. There's explicit extra credit, more points, and then there's also the... Uh, implicit, not explicit, extra credit. If you take a look at your point totals for the exams, they're always over 100, but your exams are only reported out of 100. Okay. So you have the opportunity to have obtained more points than the 100%. Okay. Other questions? Um, for this project thing, <clears throat> so on an entirely different note, the writing assignment. The writing assignment is a way to provide you a less stressful environment to go through and actually obtain the same amount of points as an exam. That's the entire intent behind it. The drafts that you've been working on or the small kind of projects that you've been working on are ways to get you thinking about it so that when you get to the final project, that becomes better. What do I expect of that final project? There are several examples on Canvas. If you go... I think it's called writing assignment. 
there's a writing assignment folder, and within that, I've got three examples of three different ways to put it together. Okay. Um, the more creative that project becomes, the more likely you get all the points. Okay. So if you just go through and provide me an essay write-up of your element, that'll get you a decent grade on it, um, but it's not going to be the most. So just a, a report format write-up of your element, I think, gets you 85% of the points. Like add clip art or something? So adding clip art is something that you can do to improve it. If it's still just a report, that's not going to improve it by a lot. To really get in that 90% and above, there should be some element of creativity behind it. Right? What are ways to make it more creative? Color. Color and marker. And that's just adding your clip art, so get a little bit more creative than that. You draw it. Right? You could draw it out. So instead of it being a report that you now draw stuff over the top of it, make it artwork. Literally, do a picture that has meaning back to your element, that embeds some of that chemistry knowledge. Okay? Drawing a rock doesn't quite work, but that's getting towards the idea of it. Okay? Yes. So actually manipulating or working with the materials can count for more. With safety in mind, so like if your element was uranium, please don't go raid the uh, <laughs> nuclear power plant to be like, check out this uranium. No, 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 no. Okay. <clears throat> but there are some elements that have more ready availability, and you can show why you would manipulate those. So in the case of welding, that's awesome. That would be a great example to use. Why is it being chosen? Why did you not say weld potassium? Why not? So there's a reason behind that. So there's a reason why we chose to use those metals to weld, okay? And why we excluded, say, other metals, okay? So it's that kind of second level thought that's what's being asked of you. So paintings, artwork works, a poster presentation isn't particularly exciting as far as I'm concerned, but there is an element of creativity behind that, and that would probably take it from the 85% to the 90%. Well, if it's bad, like, right. what about a video? Well, it, anything's bad, you're going to lose points. Okay. <clears throat> so does it have to be a drawing? No. It could also be a story. You can go through and take a look at Canvas at those assignments. There are writing projects where they wrote stories about the elements. And the characters in those stories can either represent the elements or those characters can be manipulating those elements. Okay? So instead of going to the nuclear power plant and stealing uranium, okay, you could write a story about somebody doing that and why it was an incredibly bad idea. Okay? Don't have them leave the power plant and be like, yeah, I got all this free uranium. This is awesome. Because that doesn't happen. Okay? So you could address some of those concerns, and that addresses the chemistry underlying it. Okay? That's the point of the project, is trying to address that chemical understanding. It's 100 okay? points, right? It is a total, the total writing assignment is yeah. worth 100 points. The writing project that's the end, which is what Abby, I believe, is asking about, is worth 60 points. I think it's 60, because you had the choice of your topic was five points. Yeah. 200 words was 10, 15 points. And there was the fact sheet, which was worth 10 points. And then the rest is that, right? Or then there's a draft. Yeah. Okay. That draft is really just proving that you've thought about the process on what you want to go through so and do. Draft just like a I'm not looking for a lot with the draft. Okay. Right. So you could come up with a baseline idea. I'm going to write a story about some dude breaking into the power plant because he thought it would be cool to show his teacher some uranium. These might be some of the things that would cause problems with that idea. Nice. Right. Your final draft would then be actually putting the story together. Right. There are opportunities to do sculpture. Right. You could put things together in that fashion too. Uh, when it comes to examples... I have my office littered is a, is a bit of a negative term, but my office is littered with projects. Okay? I have projects of 
uh, poster presentations. I have projects of sculpture attempts. I have projects of mobiles. Yeah. And again, it's the intent behind it. So you could be a really awful drawer. Drawer? Artist. You could be a really awful artist, but is the underlying intent behind what you were trying to draw apparent? That is fine. So say someone's studying like plutonium, right? Can you actually like, say somebody? Like, okay. Can you can you like sculpt like Pluto and like have it like you know like? What is the relevance of Pluto to plutonium? It's fine. So, and it's fine to bring in kind of the humor behind right. that, I mean, but then also make sure that the yeah. chemistry yeah. behind it makes sense as well. So yes, that would work as long as your chemistry understanding is there. Right? With the sculptures, it becomes a little bit more tricky because you have to address that content somehow. Okay? And that's where it becomes challenging. PowerPoint presentations work as well. Okay? But a good PowerPoint has just pictures. Okay? There should be relatively few words. How do you prove to me that you actually know what you're talking about? Well, there's a notes section at the bottom. Put what you would be talking about in the notes section. And that would work as a PowerPoint. Okay. Krypton is. Yep. Yep, because then you're addressing the underlying chemistry behind that material. Yes. So a comparison would work. At that point, I'm going to now kind of back off and say, is your question at least partially answered? Yes. All right. If you have specific questions about your project and you have ideas on what you want to do, talk to me. All right. Bring me your idea. It can just be words and we can discuss it, or you can actually send me an email saying, this is what I want to try and do. Okay. Yes, there are cases where I will veto it, like breaking into the power plant. Okay? So it will happen that I could veto something. And it's probably a good idea to veto it now and not the night before it's due. Make sense? Okay. Other questions? <clears throat> the ideal gas law problem we ended with Thursday, because today would be Tuesday. Right? And we went through and did this. We saw that there were two ways to go through and solve it. The way that most people went through and solved it is the real quick way that we've been discussing. Right? We said, well, you want moles of our neon. Oh, God, that E just looks awful. I don't know how people can write E there. And 2.34 liters of neon and say, well, how do I convert those? Okay, well, I don't, since I notice the substance isn't changing, it's now just a measurement conversion, can I convert liters into moles? Okay. That is one that might be a useful conversion factor to write on your cheat sheet because it is one you're required to know. Okay. That is a valid conversion factor. That is 22.4 liters is equal to one mole. But that conversion factor is only valid for a gas. Am I looking at a gas? Yes. Yeah. And it is only valid when at STP. Am I at STP? Yeah, so that conversion factor is perfectly valid, and I could go through and use that. That is what you are expected to get out of the gas law, a conversion factor that is only valid in a very narrow range of cases. Okay, but that is kind of the expectation of this unit. Okay. My grander expectation for you is to recognize that that is a useless thing to memorize, and what you should memorize instead is PV equals NRT, because that now allows you to convert or relate pressure, volume, moles, and temperature through a single equation. Okay. This is where we're stepping outside of our standard format. Because our standard format says moles and what we're starting with. Nice straight dimensional analysis. There's nothing to memorize. This is a big step outside because what am I telling you to do with PV equals NRT? Memorize it. You memorize an equation. That single equation, though, gives me access 
to a myriad of different things to solve. That's why it's important. Right? Whereas solving for moles from liters doesn't get me access to a whole bunch of different systems. It only gets me to the one with dividing by 22.4 liters. Okay, so it comes from the utility of what you're memorizing. PV equals NRT allows me to solve the top equation. Okay, the top equation, what am I solving for? Moles. Moles. What is my number for, or my symbol for moles? N in PV equals NRT. So then I would say PV over RT. Okay. What was I given? Liters. Liters is a measurement of volume. Sorry, I need this a little bit higher. So I'm saying take the volume and then times by the pressure over RT. Okay. That would then allow me to solve for moles. Well, the volume is directly given. Is the pressure given? <clears throat> STP means standard temperature and pressure. Is the pressure given? Yeah. yeah, it's one atmosphere. Also something you're required to know. What is standard pressure? Okay. What is R? A constant. Should you memorize a constant? Yeah. Why should you memorize a constant? Because it's constant. Because it's constant. It never changes. Okay. That can simplify your life if you have it memorized. Otherwise, you'd constantly have to look it up. No pun intended. I saw you laughing. I had to say that. Right? Temperature. Was I given the temperature in the question? Yeah, standard temperature, which means 0 degrees Celsius, but R is given in Kelvins, which means the temperature has to be reported in Kelvins. So not 0 degrees Celsius, but 273. Okay. When I substitute those numbers in, I get the exact same calculation as I did by taking 1 divided by 22.4. It's identical. Okay. So the conversion factor that we expect you to memorize and use, or at least that the textbook is presenting you to memorize and use, okay, directly comes from something more valuable. So my ideal world, you memorize PV equals NRT, you memorize R, you now have the utility to be able to do any conversion involving gases. Whereas if we follow just what the textbook says, you can only convert liters into moles or volume into moles. That's not useful. PV equals NRT is. Okay. That said, it's not part of our curriculum, so I can't force you to memorize it. Okay? I can't force you to do those calculations. But I can tell you right out of the gate that as soon as you move into 151, they will make you use PV equals NRT like crazy. Okay? And instead of using nice, simple units like atmospheres and kelvins, they'll change the temperatures up the yin-yang, the temperature units and the atmosphere units and the volume units, Right? So that you have to do all those secondary conversions. So if you get used to using it now, if you have to move into 151, great. That should simplify your life in 151. If you don't have to take more chemistry, do whatever you want. Except pass the class so you don't have to take it again. Okay? Make sense? Okay, so if we look at our summary, ignore that. Okay. Your responsibility is 22.4 liters of a substance is equal to one mole of a substance. Ideally, you recognize the utility of PV equals NRT. Okay? Most of those relationships are things that you're already aware of, like pressure and volume. Okay? What happens to the pressure if I decrease the volume? Okay? If I take a balloon and I now squeeze it, to get the volume down, what happens? Pressure the pressure increases. So those are inversely related. Okay, and of course I wrote this horribly. That says inversely. Okay. Mathematically, that's saying pressure is proportional to 1 over volume. Meaning if I run the calculation, 1 over a small volume is now a big pressure. Okay. 
For those of you that have trouble with that, I don't blame you, I did too. All right, this is why we have calculators. One over one gets me one. How about one over a smaller volume? What's smaller than one? Point one. What would the pressure become? You're like, oh, I gotta do that in the head. So let's switch it around. Let's start with a, a, a large volume and make it a smaller volume. Let's say volume is 10. What would my pressure be? That one, hopefully, you would have been able to do in your head. If you can't, this is why you have a calculator. What is 1 over 10? Point 0.1. All right? Now let's change the volume to 1. What did I do to the volume? Went from 10 to 1. So I shrunk the volume, right? What happened to the pressure? What is 1 over 1? 1. one. My pressure started at point 0.1 and it became 1. They're inversely related. Everybody kind of see that? All right. How about volume and temperature? Anybody seen those weird floating things in the sky? Usually out this, I um, forget, I'm located further west. So when I look out, it's like way out east, but it's probably like just in your backyards. Those weird kind of floaty things in the morning, you're like, what is that weird round object floating through the sky? <coughs> Birds are round objects? <laughs> Airplanes aren't particularly round. No one's seen them? Okay, a hot air balloon. Okay. If you watch a hot air balloon on the ground, what does it look like? A giant deflated bag. How do they get it to fly? What did they put into it? They aren't putting any air into it. They turn on a fire and blast hot air into it. What happened to the balloon? It expanded. You mean the volume increased. When you increase the temperature, what happens to volume? It goes up. Those are directly proportional, because I already started this horrible method. That says directly. Volume is directly proportional to temperature. So these are observations you can already make in your local environment. Some of them are more obvious than others. Okay? Some of them are less obvious. PV equals NRT sets it up for you always. Volume to temperature. When you look at PV equals NRT, now, what do I care about the P? Well, I don't. I just want to see the relationship between volume and temperature. What did I write? V equals T. Bigger T means bigger V, directly proportional. How about pressure and volume? Well, if I look at PV equals NRT, are they on opposite sides of the equation? PV equals NRT. Are they on opposite sides of the equation? No. So what should we do if I want to see the relationship between pressure and volume? Divide both sides by the volume. And I would get pressure equals NRT over volume. Remember, I don't care about the NRT right now. I just care about pressure and volume. If I increase the pressure, what happens? It decreases the pressure. I'm getting the exact expression shown down here. PV equals NRT contains that information. So if there's ones that aren't super obvious to you, like the moles and temperature, like when I blow more air into a balloon, I didn't notice a temperature change. It's because the temperature change isn't super obvious. Why? Because pressure and volume are also changing. So when we're looking at these systems, we're only comparing two things, and we make the assumption that everything else stays constant. So some of these relationships aren't easy for us to manipulate or see, because when we do them, we aren't paying attention that the other variables are also changing. PV equals NRT limits that and allows us to just be able to manipulate the equation and see those relationships much quicker and easier. Kind of, sort of? Yes? Uh, so I get how when we increase the temperature, the volume increases, but it shouldn't feel the other way, right? So what does increasing the volume make the temperature increase? I don't, like, how do you increase the volume of something to make the temperature increase? 
<clears throat> that becomes harder to see because what you're visualizing is increasing the volume, okay, but not changing or not changing your moles or pressure at the same time. Well, as you increase the volume, what are you changing to the pressure? You're probably also changing the pressure. So you have to make sure that the pressure stays constant. Once the pressure stays constant, you could then see the temperature change. And that goes back to the same question that I was then saying, with moles and temperature. Well, I breathe more air into a balloon. Well, there's now more moles, but I'm not feeling a temperature change. Why not? Well, what happens when I breathe into that balloon? What happened to the volume of the balloon? When you blow into a balloon, literally what happens to the balloon? It gets bigger. The volume changed. Okay? If I want to compare moles and temperature, okay, I have to make sure that the volume stays constant and the pressure stays constant. That's not very easy to do with a balloon because the instant you breathe into it, the volume is already changing. So some of those relationships are less obvious until you have specialized equipment. You don't have access to the specialized equipment. That's why PV equals NRT can help you see that. Someone already did it for you. You just have to manipulate the equation to see those relationships. Okay. <clears throat> some of them are obvious. Some of them aren't. The obvious ones will probably get tested on, and then so will the unobvious ones. The obvious ones, because I'm trying to give you kind of a softball to say, hey, do you recognize that relationship? Okay. Do you at least acknowledge that you understand gases? And then the harder question, because do you acknowledge that you understand how to manipulate the equation PV equals NRT? So there ends up being two test questions on that concept. Kind of make sense? And because it's gases, what else do we throw into it? The stupid 22.4 liters is one mole. Okay, why? Because that's what the textbook has this massive emphasis on, so we have to address that. Okay? Kind of makes sense? Okay. So, other concepts that come out of the gas law chapter. Dalton's law of partial pressure. Partial pressure. Right. Remember, our gases don't interact with each other. Okay. So if I take a container and I fill it with nitrogen gas, oxygen gas, and argon gas, well, every molecule of oxygen is going to push on the walls, the container, right? Okay. So they're exerting a force. Okay. Well, what does the nitrogen do? Exerts a force. What does the argon do? There's a force. So what does the container feel pressure from? Well, the oxygen, the nitrogen, and the argon. Okay? But the oxygen pressure isn't the same as all three of them. Why not? What contributes to the total pressure? All the atoms hitting it. Does oxygen have all of the atoms in the container? No. So its contribution will be a small part of the total pressure. And it turns out that because of all the assumptions we make in the ideal gas law, that Dalton's law of partial pressure pretty much just says, add up the pressures of each of the individual gases, that is now going to be equal to the total pressure. Okay. Because we said each of the gas Gases hold no volume. When I change to a different element, I'm not changing the volume of the gas. Because they don't interact with each other, it doesn't matter the identity of the species of the gas particle because I say they don't interact. Okay? So it's all of those assumptions we made allow this equation to be true. Okay? If those assumptions are invalid, then this equation becomes untrue. So this is why we use ideal gas law, because this allows for an easier calculation. Okay. What does this mean for us? Well, if I take a sample of gases, and I look at their partial pressures. So helium is 125 millimeters mercury. Neon is 45 millimeters mercury. Argon is 100. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Just read those numbers. What is the total pressure of the sample? You literally just add them all up. Oh, that'll be your first question? <laughs> nice. Plus one. Okay. 
right? <laughs> Arguably plus two, because it's multiple choice and it's probably worth two points. So, okay. That is literally what you do with partial pressure. Okay. Could I make it so you don't add them all up? What? How would I answer this question now? What was that? Okay, I can't solve this one. Why not? Well, let's go through and try and piece this together. Don't drop numbers in. Drop meaning in. Okay? So in our ideal system here, I just take the partial pressures of each of them. So I would take the pressure of helium, and I would add that to... The pressure of neon plus the pressure of krypton. See, told you krypton. Plus argon. Oh, yeah, that's all of them. What would that then equal? The total pressure. Because I want to solve for the pressure of argon, what can I do? Look at the periodic table. Add everything else and subtract it from the total pressure. I take my total pressure and now I subtract the mass, the pressure of helium minus the pressure of the neon minus the pressure of the krypton. There's no periodic table. Okay. Why? What are the units on the periodic table? Grams? Per mole, okay, a mass unit. This is Wait. pressure. So you can't use the periodic table. This is how we would then go through and solve. So would you give us the total pressure in that question? Okay. This is why I asked, can we solve this? And the other side of the class that never know. talks, apparently, <laughs> they don't. volunteered the answer saying it is an impossible question to solve and I asked why, and they responded, you didn't give me the total pressure. This is the equation I would have to use to solve for the argon pressure. Do I know the pressure of helium? Yes. Do I know the pressure of neon? Do I know the pressure of krypton? Yes. So I could subtract all those. That's not a problem. What am I subtracting them from? The total pressure. What is the total pressure in this system? Wasn't given. Right, so on a test question, what do I have to add? The total, the total pressure is, let's pick a number that clears all of these. I didn't want to do math. That was the problem, actually. Uh, 300 millimeters mercury. So now to solve Dalton's pressure, it's not just adding them all up. It's recognizing that that's how you solve for total pressure. Now use that information to solve for the missing piece. Right? It's always about solving for the missing piece. Not just a blank, I just add things. This isn't biology. No. <laughs> Sorry. That was, that was low. That was below the belt, Mike. Yeah, I apologize. I vaguely apologize. Thinly. Okay? Okay. And as fun as it would be to say, well, all you had to do is just memorize stuff in biology, that's exactly what I'm telling you to do here. You are memorizing that Dalton's partial pressure law is you just add the pressures up, and that equals the total pressure. But now what I'm asking you to do is manipulate that information, not just a blanket memorization. You still needed to memorize that. Because if you don't know that initial statement, then you can't solve this. You can't, don't have an <coughs> equation to solve from. Make sense? All right. So biology could sucker punch right back, because I'm just telling you to memorize. Okay. Kind of makes sense? Do we need to solve that? No. That's easy. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. 
I'm serious. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one thing in this class I would have been like, oh, that's... Yeah? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolute zero. Okay. This is really just kind of a <clears throat> interesting factoid. One of the reasons we use Kelvin is that when we go back and use the ideal gas law and extrapolate it to its extremes, we find that we achieve a minimum value for temperature. That minimum value is zero Kelvin. We can't go lower than that. Air quotes. We can't go lower than zero degrees. We can't even achieve zero because at zero then everything fails. What do you mean everything fails? All right, let's take PV equals nRT, right? I want to solve for the pressure of a gas at absolute zero. What is the pressure? Why well, I tell you what moles were. How could you solve that? What the hell did we say temperature was? Zero. So what would the pressure be? Zero. Zero. Well, that seems pretty solvable. I don't understand what you're talking about. Okay. Let's solve for the moles of gas at absolute <laughs> zero. It's just another equation. What is the moles of gas at absolute zero? Feel free, punch it in your calculator anytime you want. Okay? And your calculator is going to be like, shut up, don't ask me that question. Okay? Because we have issues with dividing by zero. The meaning of dividing by zero has two things. It can either mean zero or it can mean infinite. Okay? Because both meanings are true and both those meanings are opposites of each other, we literally have no meaning associated with it. So in real life, like, what would it be, though? It doesn't. It doesn't exist. We don't have a way to represent that. Okay? Because we don't have a way to represent that, if we ever achieved zero, our moles either becomes infinite or zero, or negative infinite, which is another fun answer to that solve. One over zero is negative infinity, zero, or positive infinity. Do we get different meanings of moles in each of those cases? Yeah. Okay. Let's just ignore the zero for a minute and let's look at a negative infinite amount of moles and a positive infinite amount of moles. That's like saying in your solution, let's pick a number that's less crazy than in here. What the hell is that? Let's pick one. I have one mole. It's not a big deal. I have in my hands negative one mole. I have a negative of something that exists. That doesn't make physical sense. Okay? At temperature zero, we lose meaning behind the ideal gas law. Okay? All sorts of weird stuff happens at absolute zero. Okay? We pretty much destroy the laws of physics. Okay? Really cool. Okay? I had air quotes up because while we have not achieved absolute zero, Mm, experimentally, officially mathematically, we have actually achieved negative Kelvins, which is really weird. Okay. Yeah, I still don't quite understand how they did it either. Okay. But it definitely brings in a bunch more advanced concepts that you would pick up a little bit in 151 and really address in 152. Okay. Um, if you've heard of the term entropy, that's really what proves it. Okay? Entropy is always increasing. Disorder is always increasing in a system. It's usually how people remember entropy is disorder. Well, what they were able to do is create a system where what did the entropy do? It decreased. It became more organized. That doesn't happen unless you've achieved negative temperatures. For Kelvin. Yep, it has to be Kelvin. Okay? Because Kelvin was an absolute scale. Absolute means it's zero up, or greater than zero officially. Okay? So, kind of neat stuff on physics there. Um, so, yeah. Now, what we're going to do is double back to actually chapter nine after we've achieved our absolute zero. Okay? And this is where things usually get people tripped up. Okay? So, while we don't have a lot of slides left, these slides 
are probably some of the most difficult in this semester. Okay? So let's go a little bit easy first. Let's bring in the concept of limiting reactants. Okay? We've got an equation. That equation is how we make a sandwich. Okay? Similar, we have equations on how you would make bicycles or equations on how you would make water. Okay? Make any substance in the world. Our chemical equations are designed to tell us how to make something. Okay? So with that equation, we now have a way to make sandwiches. Admittedly, a very boring sandwich because it's clearly missing the mustard. And, uh, yeah. Unless you're vegan. I'm not either. But let's keep it simple. One slice of cheese... Did you say there's cheese on it and that ruins it? You can get vegan. How do you run a cheese sandwich with cheese? Good point. You want a bread sandwich? Yes, it's not vegan. You want a cheese sandwich? Okay. Good point. It's not vegan. My apologies to vegans. One slice of cheese, two slices of bread, put those together, and we now make one sandwich. That's now our chemical equation. If I give you five slices of cheese and eight slices of bread, how many sandwiches can you make? Believe it or not, that's the first time that's actually been suggested. Okay. So what are we being asked to do? So a lot of you already crunched out those calculations in your head. But again, as we've been talking about for all of our conversions, don't do it in your head. Write it out. What are we solving for? Sandwiches, okay, which we'll abbreviate here as SW. Okay. What am I starting with? Five slices of cheese and eight slices of bread. Okay. I have five slices of cheese. How do I convert that into sandwiches? Well, cheese is not a sandwich, so that unit must be canceled. What's the conversion factor between cheese and sandwiches? One. Okay. We go back to our equation, again with our horrible sandwich, and it's one and one. Maybe it's a really thick slice of cheese. Okay. And our answer becomes five sandwiches. How many of you said we could make five sandwiches? Nobody. Isn't this what this shows? I can make five sandwiches? What is the assumption I'm making in this calculation? There's a big assumption I'm making with just this one question or this one calculation. How much bread do I have? I have enough. I have enough bread to convert all of those cheeses into sandwiches. Okay. Is that assumption true? Well, what would we have to do? I want to convert my eight breads into sandwiches. What is my conversion there? Two breads is one sandwich. If I did my calculation, I get four sandwiches. You've done this conversion in chemistry now multiple times. Okay. We're now doing it with sandwiches to try and make it a little bit easier, and everybody hates bicycles. Okay. I don't know why. Bicycle is pretty cool. Okay. And when we run this, we say we can only get four sandwiches. But isn't five bigger than four? Why don't I have five sandwiches? Okay. I don't have enough bread to account for all of that cheese. So I have leftover cheese. If I wanted to now add chemistry terms into this, cheese is now an excess reagent. It is an excess chemical. I can't use it all. What is the bread? Limiting. It is now my limiting reagent or my limiting reactant because it limits how much sandwiches I can make. We use the exact same concept in chemistry. Okay? Literally no difference. Okay? The part that makes it challenging is that in chemistry, you're applying weird formulas and equations to represent cheese and bread. 
Well, arguably, isn't cheese a weird formula? That's C-H-E-E-S-E. -E -E. How does that mean cheese? How does that even make logical sense? That little block of stuff that came out of the cow that we fermented and mashed and turned into this nice, tasty substance, why are you calling that cheese? Someone told you to. Who told you that salt should be written NACL? I did. Why do you trust somebody else and not me? I'm the one standing in front of Maybe that's why he trust, don't trust me. <laughs> that guy? No. Okay. It's the same concept. Cheese, though, is something that you have kind of inadvertently memorized throughout your life, so you accept that. But the instant I tell you the same concept, you're like, no, no, no. That dude, clearly no. He's making stuff up. Okay? It's the same concept. We're using a weird symbol to represent that. It's language. It's just the language you're used to working with is English. The language I'm talking about is... Jeez. Trash? <laughs> is chemistry. Okay? So you have to learn that new language. Once you've got the language, all you're doing is overlaying it off the stuff you already understand and know. Kind of make sense? Should we make it a little more challenging? So, <clears throat> here's our chemical equation. Okay. Before we start going through and making anything, we should probably make sure the chemical equation is balanced okay, and correct. Okay. So we would go through and use all of the rules that we learned in Unit 2 on balancing chemical equations to realize that that chemical equation is indeed balanced. So good, we don't have to worry about the equation messing with us. Okay. Now I can go through and look at the question. I've got two moles of sodium carbonate, two moles of water, one mole of carbon dioxide. How many moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate are produced? Admittedly, I said I was going to make this a little bit more difficult and I made this significantly more difficult. How did I make this significantly more difficult? I caused the shaking, yeah. It's my telekinetic powers. In my other job, I have no hair, and I <laughs> will roll around in a chair. <laughs> that wasn't, yeah, whatever. Oh my God. Way to take that the wrong way, guys. Watch some cartoons. People are going to get offended at you. <laughs> so, we do the same thing that we did with the last one. What are we trying to end with? Sodium hydrogen carbonate. Why is this a more difficult question than the previous one? Should we go back and look at the previous one? Yes, I agree. Let's go back and look at it. Why is my new question more difficult? If we see the question here, we see cheese, sandwich, and bread. What do we see in the chemical equation? Cheese, cheese sandwich, and bread. Right? I don't have to do any weird interpretation. It's literally there. But when I w went through and solved it, did I write out cheese? No, what I write out? CH, I came up with a symbol that nobody disputed, interestingly enough. I came up with a symbol for bread. Nobody cared. You, you were fine with it. I came up with a symbol for sandwich. Everybody was cool with it. Okay, I thought that one was a little weird, but... Okay. What happens when we move to this question? Now I'm not giving you words. I'm giving you words and symbols. Meaning, when you go through to solve this, what do you have to do? You have to do that interpretation. You have to layer that on top of already doing some other difficult stuff. Okay? So let's go through and look at it. Our sandwich in this case would be <coughs> our sodium hydrogen carbonate. Sodium, Na, hydrogen, carbonate. Oh, our product. Cool. Okay. What am I starting with? Two moles of sodium carbonate. 
I'd have to recognize that that was the symbol to use for my sodium carbonate. Okay. Sodium carbonate and sodium hydrogen carbonate, are they the same thing? Rhymes with no. It also kind of is no. What is the conversion factor between those? Two moles is sodium carbonate. Which means when I go through to solve this, what do I find out? I can make four moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Do I know what a mole is? I should, but I don't know. Weird thing. I don't, frankly, I don't care. That's what the answer is. Is that the correct answer for the question that was asked? No. What else would I have to do? I have to check every other reactant in this. Do so. How many moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate could you make? Because in theory, you've already now solved this. Two. That's interesting. This says four moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. So I don't understand your two. Maybe I should go through and actually look at the rest of the work that I was supposed to go through and do. That, that might make sense. So let's go through and take a swing at that. How many moles of H2O did I start with? Two. 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 How many mole? What is my conversion factor between sodium hydrogen carbonate and water? Two, two moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate is? One. one mole of water. I go through and solve that. You know, I'm up to eight moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate now. I don't know how you guys are getting two. What's the last one? One mole of CO2. Moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate to moles of CO2. Two. It's two to one, and I get two moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. I, I'm a little confused. You guys said two, and I see the answer is ten. Isn't four plus four plus two ten? Yeah, it is. Today is also Tuesday. That is also a true statement. Am I allowed to add 4 plus 4 plus 2? No. Just because you have numbers doesn't mean you should do stuff to it. 4 times 4 times 2 is also not 10, so that's why it's not 10. That's not relevant. Use the same rules that we applied to making a sandwich. When we applied to making a sandwich, we looked at our answers and we said whichever one was the smallest number was the one that made our sandwiches. So how much sodium hydrogen carbonate could we make? Two. The other ones were both assumptions that we had enough water and enough CO2 to react with the sodium carbonate. For the second one, God, that's really irritating. I don't know how you guys can look at that. The next one. Not the trying to <laughs> shake it at the same velocity. <laughs> well, that's a little better, right? Yeah. The next one, I made an assumption that sodium carbonate and CO2, see, are now in enough to react with all the water. The last one, what am I assuming? There's enough sodium carbonate and enough water to react all of that. So each of those calculations, I'm making an assumption. At the end of all of those calculations, I then test that assumption. God, I'm going to go back to this one. It's not right. And when I go through and look, yes, yeah, so whenever I get near it, it starts to vibrate, right? Okay. That's the smallest amount I could possibly make. There's my answer. What does that mean as far as the limiting reagent? What is my limiting reagent? CO2. Because it's the reagent that produced the smallest amount. The smallest amount is going to be my answer. That's the most I could possibly make out of this. All right. What are the other two reagents? They're now excess reagents. So when I run this reaction, what I've shown is the ideal situation where everything cancels out and everything works out. All right. But when I mix the chemicals, did I mix them in the perfect ideal ratio? No. Why not? Because there's other things that could go into this that factor that I have to account for. Okay, which 
and you don't have to stress about right now because you aren't concerned about the design of an experiment. You're designed about just, I hope it does the, real, the ideal situation. Okay? Because the real world is so much crappier that we have to do some other stuff to fix it. So what you do is you focus on the ideal situation. Once you've got the ideal situation nailed, then we'll throw you into lab and show you that the real world sucks. But it's fun at the same time. Okay, so um, so if this were a test, it'd be the two moles, right? Yep. So why would we do the first two? If, like, wouldn't you just want to go to the smallest amount of moles and just do that conversion? You know what I'm saying? It only worked out in this case oh, for, the other for this question. Okay. Okay. So it all depends on the question. Okay. So we have to run all of those calculations to go through and test because it's all really centering on that mole mole conversion. It's that conversion that sets you up. And yes, I am aware that someone goes, well, I'm just going to do that one because it's the smallest number. And probably what you'll see on the test is it doesn't work. Okay. So when we go through and do it, we have to test all of them. Okay. Uh, and I have a, a quick counterexample for you. We had eight slices of bread, right? Yeah. And five slices of cheese. Well, five slices of cheese is the smaller number, so that's the limiting one, isn't it? No. Damn it. The small starting number does not necessarily mean that's going to be the smallest amount produced. It all depends on the equation. Is it usually? It all depends on the equation. Okay, 50-50. So if all you want is a 50% in this class, then yes, just do that. Okay. I don't want you to get a 50%, so I'm not asking you to do that. In fact, I'm telling you to not do that. That's a bad <laughs> idea. Okay. That is the limiting reagent concept. Okay. Could it be made more difficult? You're like, seriously? Yes. How could it be made more difficult? What unit did we start with here? Moles. Moles. Did we have to start with moles? No, we could have started with grams. Okay. Grams would work out great for the sodium carbonate because it's a solid. That's how we measure solids, is using grams. Okay. What would the first thing be that I have to do? Convert to moles. Why do I need to be in moles? So I can convert the substance. So great. That would be a great unit to give for sodium carbonate, and it adds an extra conversion. What phase is H2O in this? A gas. Would grams be a good unit to give for that? No. What would be a good unit to give for the gas? Volume. Volume. Right? Great. So liters. Does liters convert substances? No. So what would be the first conversion I have to do? Convert the liters into? Moles. Because I have a conversion between liters and moles, assuming it's a gas and at standard temperature and pressure. So all of those conversions we've already done through the rest of the semester can be stacked in and thrown in in front of these. Okay. Doesn't happen so much in this class. Okay. Where that happens is in second semester, or it's not second semester, 151 and 152. Okay. So let's take it to the next step without having to do all those extra conversions. We'll get this idea of percent yield. Okay? The whole point of this is to standardize or normalize your experiments. Okay? You do an experiment and produce five grams of gold. Let's ignore the fact that you'll probably steal it. Because okay? I would probably do it too. <clears throat> you produce five grams of gold. Uh, I produce 500 grams of gold. Who did it better? I did because I produced 500 grams, right? Yeah, so okay. You started with five grams. I started with 500 tons. Who did it better? Not me. Why? I lost. There's this giant mass that I had to sift through to get that amount. You started with five grams and ended with five grams. Okay. You all of a sudden did better. Nothing's really changed about it. The amounts at the end are still the same. But the amounts that we started with are an important factor on deciding on who did it better. Okay? 
If we try to go through and make sandwiches and you make one, but I make two, but you start with only two slices of bread and I start with 50 loaves of bread, I'm probably really bad at making sandwiches. Right? You should probably be the one making sandwiches, not me. Right? Make sense? So we have to have a way to normalize the end results of our experiment. We normalize them by comparing them back to what we started with, okay? or what we could theoretically have obtained. So we take an actual end result and compare that to our theoretical. The theoretical will always be calculated, right? because it's theoretical. We start with what we started with and say, well, how many things could I have made from that? So we do all the calculations we just did for limiting reactant to get your theoretical, right, which could be a useful little addition on this. The theoretical is a limiting reactant calculation, so LR calculation for limiting reactant. Where do you get the actual information from? What you did. Right? That would be the experimental result. If I then compare the actual yield to the theoretical and then multiply by 100, I then have a percent. And I can compare the percents as an efficiency between those two experiments. Right? Some other things to address here. What are the units on the percent yield? Okay, percent. So out of 100, what would the units be on an actual yield? Grams. What happened to the gram unit if the answer unit is just percent? It had to get canceled, which means what are the units on the theoretical? Grams. Okay. The units must cancel each other. So the units of the actual yield are the same as the units of the theoretical. Is grams a complete unit? No. I appreciate the volunteering, though. It is not a complete unit because it is ignoring the substance. Okay. So when we go through the... Oh, man. I'm sorry. And that's not much better. So I'll just look this way. Okay. When we look at our percent yield, the units on the actual must be the same as the units on the theoretical. And that is both the measurement and the substance. If those units are not the same, they cannot cancel out, which means you don't get a percent yield. Okay? So if we looked at our question now, two moles of sodium carbonate mixed with two moles of water and one mole of carbon dioxide, and here's an extra little bit of information, 0.5 moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate are produced, then what is the percent yield of sodium hydrogen carbonate? What am I solving for? Percent yield of sodium hydrogen carbonate, which means I need an actual yield of the sodium hydrogen carbonate, and I would need a calculated yield for my limiting reactant. I can then multiply by 100%. Where is the actual yield found? In the question. In the question. Yeah, what's the... <laughs> I was trying to give you a hint on what to read off to me. 0.5 moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate are produced. It is our 0 0.5 moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. That was our actual yield. That's what it tells us. Sodium hydrogen carbonate are produced. Okay. What is the calculated yield? What is our theoretical maximum that we could do? Well, shoot, it says calculated. I'd have to go through and do a calculation. So I'd have to go through and do, well, I assume I have enough water to react to the carbon dioxide. And I can set up my calculation. This starts to look kind of familiar, right? Why does it look familiar? Because we literally just did it, right? And you have awesome notes on it because you all wrote it down, right? And you can tell me that the answer for the calculated yield was <coughs> 2 moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. 
times 100, and we'd have our answer. The yield that we got was 25%. Okay. Not a really good yield, but that's how we run the calculation. Okay. When it comes to the test, what we'll end up doing is not making you do the limiting reagent calculation also, because that's now layering two pieces of concepts together. So on the test, what you'll be given is the calculated yield. It'll say the calculated yield is and your actually produced was 0.5 moles. That would really just be two numbers. So you could either divide them one over the other, which means there's two answer choices because you divided them wrong. Okay? In theory, we could throw in the multiplication of them. That's three answer choices. Well, a test is supposed to have five. Where do I get the other two answer choices? I don't really have a choice unless I throw in a random third number. And that's usually what happens. We'll throw in a random third number that has no bearing whatsoever on the calculation. But if you don't know what you're doing, you just start jamming numbers into the calculator, and magically, what happens? You get the number that shows up as one of the answer choices. And go, oh, I must be right. Okay? So make sure you plug in the values that are actually correct. You're dealing with the actual yield and the calculated yield. Okay? After that, we've got some summary slides, conversion factors, and ultimately where to find them, which we've already <laughs> talked about. Again, another conversion factor slide. Uh, that's a hard example, so I want to skip that for the moment. All right, where we will pick up on Thursday is we'll take a look at this really hard different calculation, and then we'll also look at empirical formulas and molecular formulas. Ultimately, all you're doing is following these steps. That's all I really want you to get out of those is following those steps.